Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Kelly. I'm also from Canada. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my good friend and colleague and fellow Angelman parent, Erin uh, Sheldon. She's presenting this afternoon on a communication training project. And we're delighted to have her here and always love hearing, speaking, her, hearing her speak. Every time I hear Erin speak, and it's probably been ooh, over 20, maybe 30 times now, I'm learning something new every single time. There's a lot of great information that this woman is bringing to our community. I know that my family is very grateful for the revolution that she is leading for our children and the changes that are being made. So thank you, Erin, for coming. We're so excited to have you, and we look forward to hearing from you this weekend. Please welcome Erin Sheldon. Thank you. So I am, I'm a mom, like um, Kelly said. My daughter Maggie is 12 next month. She's actually here with me, so if you see a little redhead with uh, pink in her curls, that would be Maggie. Um, and I started all this, I mean, like all of you, I, I was actually a union negotiator. I had a great career, and then my little girl gets diagnosed with something called Angelman Syndrome. and. By the time she was six or seven, uh, it had just become clear to me that her team at school, the therapists who'd been supporting her, everyone liked her so much. Everyone loved her. They wanted to take good care of her. It didn't feel like anyone knew how to teach her. It didn't feel like we had a plan where I could see where we were now and where Maggie would be as an adult with the skills and abilities to meet all of her communication needs and just maximize her potential. Um, and so I had this idea, I would go back to school. I would, surely someone out there would know. So I would just go to graduate school. I would get the information. I would bring it back to Maggie's team. Uh, we'd put it all into motion and it would be so easy. Uh, that, was my, that was my idea. So I went back to uh, graduate school when Maggie was in second grade. So she's now going into seventh. Um, and it turned out to be much more complicated than I expected. Um, Maggie is one of our more complicated kids. If you meet her, um, she isn't quite as social as many of our kids are, right? She will often turn her back on someone who's actually greeting her. She, um, when we first tried to start using a communication system with her and we'd point to the symbols and I would try to get her to look, she would always look the other way. And if I insisted she look, she would get up and leave the room. She was a kid where I would try to sit down and read stories to her and she would literally leave the room. It was very, very challenging. Um, but while I was in school and I was just going to anyone I could find saying, please tell me who would know how to teach my child. Um, and all these names started coming out to me that I needed to talk to Linda Burkhart. I needed to talk to Carolyn Musselwhite. I needed to talk to Gretchen Hanser. These are just leaders in the field. Karen Erickson for literacy information. David Coppenhaver for literacy. So I started stalking all these people. These were like famous presenters. And I went to conferences and sat in the front row and followed them like to the washroom practically, um, trying to make sure I could get as much information from them as possible. And what I learned about Maggie um, through all of that and through getting more help was that she has significant um, vision issues and significant auditory processing issues. And that just created extra barriers for her for communication compared to most of our kids. So we started this, this uh, journey with Maggie. Um, we got extra support because she is extra complicated and you'll hear a little bit about, because you might find that some of your kids have some of these extra complications. Um, but it was fascinating when a year ago, after all these strategies that you'll hear some about today, after we'd started using them, a speech therapist came in to do a formal assessment of Maggie. The way it works in Ontario where we live, the child has to prove they can use the system before it can be prescribed for them. So we had been using an iPad-based program um, on our own as a family and at school to try to get her to a point where she could actually pass the assessment. So the speech therapist comes to school and she's going to formally assess her. And you guys know how these assessments go. Touch the this. Show me that. Maggie actually passed the assessment. It's the first time she's ever passed a communicate, an AAC assessment. But she did it completely on her own terms. When the therapist told her to show me things, she said, stop that. When she was told um, to sit patiently and wait, she said, share, because she wanted the materials that were 
that she was supposed to sit patiently and wait for. When she was told to say, I'm sorry, for pulling her friend's hair because she didn't want to wait any longer, um, she looked at, I'm sorry, moved her finger over, and touched, I love you. When um, the therapist felt she finally had Maggie in a position where she could say, okay, I just need you to show me some things for the assessment, Maggie said, thank you, finished, leave, now. <laughs> That's my girl. The second half of that story, though, is that that night, um, we had talked a lot about the assessment. Maggie knew it was coming. She doesn't usually use symbols that much. She's still very emergent in this. But that night, she seized all night. That is how much it takes out of Maggie to use one of these communication systems. She can do it. She's learning. We're doing everything we can to make it easier. But for her brain to get her hand and her finger to do exactly what she needs it to do at exactly the right time, it has actually triggered um, bouts of, of seizures for her. And it did that night. It did that whole night. It really showed me how stressful that assessment was for her. Um, so as you hear all of this information, as we talk about all of this stuff, know that. And this is why I have a message with Maggie's team. No one ever is to sit my kid down and say, show me. And we'll talk a little bit about why we do that. But number one is because it takes so much out of her to get her brain to tell her hand what to do that you had better not waste her time. And you had better not ask her to do it for a casual reason out of your curiosity. Because that is her communication system. That is for her to take ideas from her head and share them with you. It is not her parrot system where you tell her what to say and she echoes it back. That is not what her system is all about. And that's what I hope this communication project will be with the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, is figuring out how we can support all of our kids to take the ideas from their heads that we don't know that they're thinking and help them share, share them with us. Share the most important ideas in their heads with us. Because if they're going to organize their bodies to be able to use these systems to tell us the things we don't know that they're thinking, then we'd better not spend a lot of their time wasting their time show, having them show us things that we already know the answer to that aren't actually sharing anything new. So that's my story with Maggie, and I'm hoping that um, that's what you'll get out of the next year of this Angelman um, Syndrome Foundation communication training pro uh, project, is how can we help our kids share the ideas they're not already sharing. We know our kids with Angelman, I've been on a road trip. I'm on a 80-day yeah, road trip right now. Um, doing presentations and workshops and camps with Angelman families all over the US. We've been uh, from Canada, we've been down to Louisville, Kentucky, Dallas, uh, where else did we go? Uh, Phoenix, uh, Los Angeles, Malibu, we had a surf camp. We had kids with Angelman on surfboards and then had the next week to read, write, and talk about that amazing experience on surfboards. It was wicked. Uh, that was with the um, Voice for Maddie Foundation. Uh, Angelman family has a little foundation in LA. We went up to Sacramento, and then we came here, and from here we're going all over the place. Um, and you guys know this, there's a lot of similarities between a lot of our kids. And some of the most common things you'll see with our kids is that they have a strong social interest. They want to communicate. They want to interact. Even kids like Maggie, who's, who's considered autistic, um, she very much wants to interact. She just has lots of sensory issues. So she comes over to you, but she just needs the interaction to be on her terms. Um, our kids have a high rate of what's called social approaches. So they go up to people all the time. And so many of our kids, you can tell, they've got a story to share. They go up and they smile, they beam, their hands are excited. And there ain't much that follows if they don't have a communication system, if they don't have tools. We'll talk this whole year over the course of this project about both communication systems to get words out there, but also supports to help them get their stories out there, books about themselves, all kinds of different things that we can do. Because our kids have a story to tell. And they go up to people and they smile, and people smile back. And we got to figure out the tools that let our kids now take that to an actual interaction, an actual back and forth. Because our kids want it. Um, 
overall, our kids have a fairly, and I should say our individuals, our adults, our sons and daughters, overall have um, a relatively low rate of using communication systems that are symbol-based. And we're going to talk about why and what those barriers are and try to help our kids overcome them this year. And our kids tend to have a huge strength when it comes to their visual skills. Um, this has been backed up in all kinds of research with our kids. We've got so many stories at these camps of um, you know, people who five years ago went down a certain road to go to an amusement park. And as they pass that same road five years later, their child's like, ah, ah, ah. Take me to the amusement park. Our kids, our sons and daughters, compared to so many of their disabilities, one of their big strengths is their visual skills, which is why these communication systems are so important. But they face so many barriers. Our kids have a comprehensive neurological disorder, which means the brain operates the entire body. And therefore, so many parts of the body can be affected because of what's going on in our kids' brains. One of them is called apraxia. This is something seen in Rett syndrome, something seen in Parkinson's, something we see in some of our kids, where they are thinking about something, but their brain can't get their hand to go out and do it. So they get kind of frozen in space. And some of you might have seen your kids. You can see an expression on their face that tells you they're thinking about it, but they just can't get their body to do it. Um, another thing we see is dyspraxia. The harder they concentrate, the more the hands might flap. The harder they concentrate on what this hand is going to do, that hand might go out and whack somebody. Um, they're thinking about touching a button uh, on a communication system, but their hand actually reaches out and pulls someone's hair. This is called dyspraxia. This is a motor planning disorder. It's neurological. The connection between the brain and what their hands need to do is disrupted. And their brain will tell their hand one thing, and their hand will do something else. This is called dyspraxia. We can use this. We've got published research showing our kids have dyspraxia. We can use this term with school teams so they can better understand our kids as learners, that so much of what their bodies do is not actually what their brains are telling their bodies to do. Um, and we need to support them through it. Our kids have fine motor disabilities, gross motor disabilities, oral motor disabilities. You guys know this. This creates access barriers. They cannot, most of our kids cannot use speech to communicate. We're going to talk about what we have to do to create access to true alternative communication for them. And many of our kids have quite severe fine motor disabilities where it just becomes very difficult for them to try to use any of these word-based or picture-based um, systems, but we'll work on those access issues over the course of this year. Uh, our sons and daughters are very high risk to have disruptions with their vision and their hearing in terms of their eyes might see fine, but what the brain does with that information might very well be disrupted. So we know, for example, that about 20% of children, uh, individuals with significant disabilities have what's called cortical visual impairment. The brain affects the vision. And you see this in our kids when they use their peripheral vision rather than their direct vision. You'll see it with kids where you try to read them a book and they look away. They're actually listening, but it's too much for their brain to look and listen at the same time. This is one of the first things we encounter, which I encountered when I tried to start modeling, which you'll hear more about in a minute, tried to start showing Maggie symbols in a display she could communicate with. She wouldn't look. I was talking and showing her something at the same time, and she couldn't do those two things at the same time. So she would look away, and I thought she wasn't paying attention. When we see those behaviors in our sons and daughters, we need to ask if it's a sensory issue, if it's a vision and auditory processing issue. Um, auditory processing disorders are compared to, if you could imagine, hearing all of the voices around you as though they're coming through water. So for Maggie, that really affected her ability to comprehend uh, spoken language. Um, and what's been extremely important for her is to understand it's not a cognitive issue. When she is struggling to understand spoken language, it's, an, it's a hearing issue. It's an auditory issue. And we can actually support her to comprehend spoken language um, rather than this default assumption that everything our kids do is because of their intellectual ability. And finally, there's huge barriers. As you start to try to implement some of what you'll hear about this year, you're going to experience what's called performance anxiety, where we say, I went to all these workshops, and I was told, 
take this symbol system, go home and model it to your child. Talk to your child using this system. That sounds really simple. It's actually incredibly awkward. You don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to get it wrong. You feel like a dork because you can't find any of the words, right? You're stuttering. You're stammering. You're like, uh, what can I say with this limited set? Well, if that's how we feel looking at these systems, and we're literate and we can read the label underneath the symbol and that kind of stuff, how must our kids feel? And how must it feel to have something unfamiliar put in front of you and constantly be told what to say rather than just have lots and lots of models of how we can use that? So you'll see it more, but just know that I think the performance demand on our kids, performance anxiety, is one of their biggest barriers. We had um, one of the camps we just had in Malibu, we'd broken the groups up, and one group were all um, older students with Angelman who were using communication systems. So at school, at home, they were consistently using their system, they were putting together sentences. But when we actually sat them down and went, okay, we need you to finish this sentence, they got silly, they got distracted, they all eyes were on them, and all of a sudden, we saw all kinds of interesting behaviors, but we didn't see using their system. That's performance anxiety. And the more that you try to use these systems and try to put together a, system, a sentence quickly, you'll start to experience that performance anxiety yourself. So this project with the ASF, um, you're going to see this outline. Um, You'll, that you'll see coming up on the slides many times over the next year. It's an organizational system developed by someone more, named Maureen Nevers, um, who's one of the expert uh, speech therapists who's part of this project. So what she's done is she went to all these workshops too and then reorganized the information so we could be more coherent and consistent. She talks about targets. She talks, so targets are our goals, what it is we want our kids to learn, and I'll come back to the slide in a minute. She talks about teaching and tasks. So teaching is what are the activities that we want our teachers to do, that we need to do as families um, to actually help our kids reach those targets. So if our targets are for all of us um, as families and caregivers and educators of individuals with Angelman, our, our targets are for us to learn how to support our kids to communicate using a visual language. Um, and here's how we're going to do it. Our targets are we're going to do this by creating a really accessible training program for parents and educators. The tasks that go along with that, here's the teaching and the tasks. Tasks are what we want students to do, and teaching is what we want the teachers to do, or in, us, in our case, um, those of us who are leading this project. We're going to form, we're going to be putting on these webinars. They will be, there will be a course of webinars from um, September, I think the first one will actually be in August, all the way to next June. They will each build on each other. You don't have to start at the very beginning. If you miss some, you're done. You can go back and always catch up. Um, you can follow your own child, your own son or daughter's uh, speed of progression as you go through it. What we were finding was we were doing all these workshops where we were saying, you need to model language to your child using a communication system. You need to uh, be reading lots of books with them and modeling language while you're reading. You need to get them involved in writing as much as possible with the alphabet, with alternative pencils, with... <laughs> we told families and school teams all of this information. It's how I was told all this information in workshops. I went home completely overwhelmed trying to figure out how to implement it. Turned out everybody else did too. I thought I was the only one who couldn't go to these workshops and actually do anything with all that information. It turned out we're all in the same boat. So what we're trying to do is just give it out in small amounts of information that will build on itself from one webinar to the next over the next year. Um, there will be webinars, but there will be lots of supporting information. So for example, there will be times when we will talk about how to read books to our children while using a communication system. There will be books you just can download books that are age respectful for our sons and daughters regardless what age they are. Um, we have some highly entertaining, completely free books available on various websites that we will share. You guys can download and use them. You'll have examples of language to use with those storybooks. You'll have um, lessons about what words you might focus on while reading that specific book. So it will just build and build. And then we might use those same words two weeks later um, where we're actually writing with our kids, we're modeling how to use their system to actually write a sentence. 
that kind of thing. So we'll have started by using the words with our child while communicating, then we'll use those same words while reading, then we'll use those same words while writing, and each lesson will build on itself. Um, so these are the teaching and tasks. So these are the different kinds of activities that will come. Um, anyone can join this webinar series. It will be completely free. There will be a Facebook group so that we can have lots of conversation about what's going on. Because all of us who are on Facebook have seen how that can really create community and enthusiasm and, and just help with all the problem solving. Um, we have an education group currently where people come on and say, tell me, what was I supposed to do with this? And a dozen moms will all step in and provide answers. A dozen teachers and therapists will provide responses. It's just been a great format. So we're going to use that social media format in this project. So we have targets to help our kids um, learn how to communicate with a visual language, help our families, help our educational teams learn how to support our kids to do this. We have our teaching and our tasks, which will be um, unfolding over the next year. We'll have tools. So these are the different tools that you will have access to. So the webinars will be bi-weekly. They'll be recorded. Anyone can access them at any time. Um, we'll have webinar guides. So for every webinar, you'll have a one-page handout that you can download to help explain the information that will be in the webinar. Some of us learn better from reading, and we just rather read a one-page handout. Some of us learn better by being able to hear it as well as part of a webinar. So we'll provide it both ways. There will be conversation about it in the Facebook group. We'll have a variety of training tools um, that you can download, so sample symbol displays, sample literacy activities, um, and we're really trying to develop a curriculum over the course of the year. So this format that you're seeing where we're talking about targets for our kids, the teaching and tasks, the activities that we need to do to help our kids reach those targets, the tools that we're going to use to help our kids reach those targets, the testing, how will we know if we're reaching our targets? All of you who've worked on individual education plans, IEPs, um, you know that every goal we have needs to be measurable. We need to have outcomes and we need to know if we're making progress. So we'll start the project with a survey um, that we'll be asking everyone who's participating to complete. It will help give us an idea of your child, your son or daughter's baseline, where they're at right now, and the activities that you're already doing with them so that we can then measure that again in June and see what has changed. Um, about halfway through, we'll do a survey just about the format of the system and if there's anything that now that you've gone through several months, is there anything you guys need changed so that we can improve it while we're going. And lastly, what are all the different resources that your teams can expect um, to get? So we have um, sort of this very first introduction. We'll have uh, some webinars in August just talking about communication displays. Um, we'll have a variety of things that you can download. And we have some samples over here that you can take a look at, which are if you don't currently have a communication system, we will get you started on something. It's just a starter, but it'll give you some basis for comparison, some basis for knowing what it is you're looking for in a system. You'll be able to um, view these webinars, engage in the activities, share your experiences, your challenges, troubleshoot, and share your successes through our surveys and our Facebook group. So this is just kind of hopefully an overview um, of what to expect of the project. And I'm going to try to clarify some things next. But does anybody have any questions about just this part? Go ahead. Can you? No? OK. Yes. Where's Kelly? Kelly. If you have a question, go ahead and go to the mic. Um, th this sounds like too good to be true, and I'm so thrilled for it. Um, but the question I had was, given that you're going to have all these families and educators involved in which all the kids are going to be at different age groups, at different um, maybe literacy writing levels, how are you going to, is the plan to break it down? Um, like how are you going to do it insofar as the words being t taught and things of that nature? No, that's a great question. Um, and thank you, because I should have mentioned that. So we are going to be making this multi-age and multi-level so that through that first survey that you fill out, we'll have a sense of your child's baseline and we'll be able to sort of recommend for you what stream we think you're going to be on. You'll be doing something different if your child is in preschool and has no system versus if they're school aged and they have, maybe they have an iPad app and they're using it really well for requesting. 
right? They can do a few things really well, but how do we get them to the next level? So you'll do something different with those kids. You'll do something different if you've got an adolescent or an adult who has no communication system and you're just starting out. You're not going to use the same materials as a preschool family. Um, so you'll see once the survey comes out, that will really help us figure out what those different streams need to look like. But really what we see is young children with no system and families who are relatively newly diagnosed. We see um, school age children, it's a different situation once you're school age. Because whatever you go to do with a communication system, you really need schools buy-in. Our kids spend six and a half, seven hours a day at school. We really need to do something in completely in partnership with the school system. So there's things we can do when our kids are really young and at home the whole time, where we kind of control their whole environment that changes once they get into school and we're trying to do stuff where both the school and the family are on the same page. And then it becomes very different again once our sons and daughters are adults. But know that some of these interventions, when these were done uh, statewide across the state of Western Australia for every individual with Angelman, it was the adults who made the fastest progress. Adults who had never had a communication system made the fastest progress when we did these interventions with them, when a, a group in, in Australia did these interventions with them. Very, very interesting to see how by the time our sons and daughters are adults, They've had stories to tell that have built up for a really long time. They are looking for much more stimulation. They have much calmer bodies. They tend to stay in one place for a much longer period of time, which actually can be really helpful when you're trying to do a variety of different activities. And so for, for a variety of reasons, um, our adults are particularly ripe for some of these interventions. So yes, there will be multiple uh, streams. For some of your sons and daughters, you'll be looking more at things like sentence construction um, and storytelling, being able to really share their own experience Experiences, um, because they've already got some of that initial language skills. For some of our kids, we're going to be trying to just teach them how to comprehend spoken language better through having this visual support of a communication system. For some of our kids, the first step is teaching them that when we speak a word, it can be represented by a symbol on the page. Some of your sons and daughters are already there, and they're actually ready for sight word instruction, fluency, phonics instruction, that kind of thing, and we'll have a whole stream for the kids who are at that point. Go ahead. Hi, will you be making these um, PowerPoint slides available in some form yes. for us? So I will put these PowerPoint slides, this handout here of these five steps, um, and a two-page handout from Caroline Musselwhite, all in the new Facebook group. Um, it will also get posted um, on the Angelman Syndrome Foundation website. They'll be creating a section of the website just for this. The Facebook group has already been created. Um, and if anybody's from the ASF is here, I know I'm an admin, so if you're friends with me, you can, I can find it. I haven't actually added anyone to it, but I've been added to it, so. Um, and I'll post that in the Angelman Education and Literacy Group and on the ASF uh, Facebook page as well, so you guys can all see that link and can join, and that's where we'll put all these, these handouts. Hi, Erin. I'm really excited to hear that this is happening, because I am one of those parents who went to a uh, brief seminar that you did in Sacramento, California last year, shortly after my daughter became a recipient of the ASF iPad program. And I went away all excited with all these great apps and I got home and I went, oh my God, <laughs> what do I do now? I was really confused. I'm still lost to this day, really struggling through just trying to teach not just myself and my daughter, but the people that are teaching my daughter to how to work this program. So I'm really excited about the webinar portion of it. But I'm wondering within this project, is there a consideration for a more comprehensive, like communication camp program to teach educators and parents with the children at the camps how to really teach it? Because I can watch the webinar, but really putting hands on hands and teaching directly is where I get stuck. I think that is a gorgeous long-term goal. I would love to. I think the closest we have to that is Karen Erickson and David Coppenhaver have literacy intensive courses. These are five-day courses for um, really for educators. Um, and then they have an intensive where it's a camp setting with kids who use communication devices. One of our kids went through that camp um, a year ago. These are very high level professional development for teachers. They're quite expensive. Specialized teachers go through them. One of my goals is to figure out how to take that model and bring it to our 
communities. Um, there's folks in Australia like Jane Farrell and um, I think it's Sally Clendon are doing these as well. So we have access to these curriculums. They're just really resource intensive. Um, the other thing that we've been doing, so I've done a number of these now, um, camps and workshops. I can't actually think about how many I've done because I'm the numbers are going fuzzy in my head. But um, where we bring our kids together with our families, um, and I'm realizing that that camp model of bringing all our families together, um, it's really a third or fourth or a fifth step. Because in the very beginning, we really need to talk with parents about like what that communication system needs to look like. It's really hard to do that with our kids in the room, right? Especially our really, really busy kids who really want to have that social interaction now. We've been trying to do that. Um, and we've had varying levels of success. We've had families bring a caregiver and we've set up an alternate space. But our kids tend to, be, want, to, tend to want to be where the action is and they want to join us. Um, so we've done some that are a combination where, what did we do in Sacramento? We had a day that was just parents, and then the next day, so this was just this last weekend, and then the next day, the next day we um, had the parents in teams, so we would sit down with two families and me, or two families, and we had an assistive technology specialist um, from San Francisco. We had um, a super mom named Corey Stell, um, who's an experienced pod user, and we sat families down, and I think that was extremely important. Um, so what I'm finding, what I'm just personally finding in all the workshops we're doing is that this large group stuff has a place, the webinars have a place, but then we really need to be able to help figure out, and I don't know how to do this, really one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-one, sit down and talk about what this means for your child. And then, once you have some experience, you've helped develop a system, you're comfortable with it, you've had some coaching, now you're ready when you get to the next step for more of a group setting where we try to bring more kids together. So it's, it's kind of evolving. But that, this whole road trip this summer is really to learn what works and what doesn't. And I'm definitely learning a lot about what doesn't. So. So let me move on um, just to more about what the communication intervention, um, what it is that we're going to be working on. So can you guys just share with me, if, if you've been to a recent workshop, you've seen this slide, um, but why are some reasons that all of us communicate with each other? Anybody? Throw it out. Shout it out. What's that? Needs. Okay, we need to get our needs met. So we want to change the behavior of other people to get our needs met. What else? Social closeness. We want to interact. We want to be social. We want to share our stories. We want to build relationships. Again, social closeness. Why else? What's that? OK. Get something that we want. I've been on a road trip, so I'm doing a lot of ranting. Sometimes I just need to vent, get a story out that way. There's lots of reasons why we communicate. We're trying to affect change. We're trying to share our opinions and our preferences. We're trying to share our stories and experiences. If we look at how communication develops in small children, it starts out as a narrative. It starts out as wanting to understand my story and share my story with other people. But if we look at our sons and daughters with Angelman and the communication supports that are generally put in place for them, it's generally ways for them to request things, generally ways for us to test them, and generally they're relying on their body to communicate anything else. So we go back and look at all the reasons why we communicate, and then we look at what's been placed in front of our children as tools, and you can see it's very, very limited for all the reasons to communicate. When you look at how socially motivated our kids are, and then look at their systems, and we ask, what is that system? What social interaction does that system allow them to have? If one of their primary motivations in life is to interact with other people, what kind of quality interactions can they have with the toilet symbol? There's not a lot, and yet I've seen a lot of our kids' systems, and a lot of them look a lot like this. And what happens is once they start using them, so maybe they're hitting more when they want more crackers, we go, oh, good, let's change it all up because we're not sure they're using it on purpose. So now we're going to move all the symbols around and see if they can actually discriminate, and then we're going to move them all around again. And we give them systems like this, which is what Carolyn Musselwhite calls words from heaven. 
Words from heaven are words you never have any idea if they're going to be in front of you. They float down. You're supposed to choose between them, and then they float away again and go somewhere else, and you can't access them until the next time that someone else decides to put them in front of you. Words from heaven. And what we end up with is what Kate Ahern kind of developed a system <laughs> where a lot of our kids, there's only one of these symbols that they're actually communicating to us very often. They're very frustrated with the limitations and they start just basically boycotting the system altogether. And what we then result in is teachers and speech therapists who have looked at it and gone, well, this child just isn't ready for a communication system yet. But when we look at all the reasons why we communicate, and then the tools that we've put in front of our children, it's no wonder the level of frustration they have with those tools. Fundamentally, communication is when I tell you something you didn't already know I was thinking, and you tell me something I didn't already know you were thinking, right? When we share, that's what communication fundamentally is. And to me, this is the rule we have to keep asking. Is your child's system, is what the therapist is doing, is what the teacher is doing, or what we're, what we're doing with the system, is it inviting our child to share something we didn't know they were thinking? And if it's not, then we're actually not asking them to communicate, right? With any alternative system, what anyone can say with it is the least of what they're trying to say. And you will experience this the minute you try to use a system to talk to your child. You will suddenly realize how difficult it is. That is the biggest lesson for us as parents is how hard it is. What we can say with our children's system is the least of what we are understanding and wanting to communicate. Therefore, what our sons and daughters can say with their system is the floor, it's the bottom, it's the least of what they're trying to say. There are some fabulous communication systems out there. Like, if you know anyone who's using POD, it is a fabulous system. It allows you to communicate so many things. And it still allows our sons and daughters to communicate the floor and not the ceiling of what they're thinking. Because any system that is not speech is harder for us to use, period. They're all harder. I mean, my, my mantra is basically, I personally think that alternative communication systems kind of suck. They just do. We haven't come up with anything better. This is the best of what we've got, but the best of what we have is still not enough. It's still frustrating. We still get lost trying to say things with them. And we need to use these systems ourselves so we can experience that frustration. Because there's a myth in our community that if you just get a kid an iPad with an app and put it in front of them, now he's got words. Well, now why do we still see challenging behaviors? Come on, kiddo, get with the program. You've got words now. No, the frustration of learning how to find all of your words is an intense frustration. And we have to be on that journey with our kids. We have to be experiencing that frustration. We have to be experiencing those roadblocks to finding the language, or we can't ask them to. So how do we develop communication skills in our kids? That's what we'll be looking at over the course of the next year. The big question for communication for our sons and daughters is, have they ever had a model of language that they could access? I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that. I was in a restaurant yesterday, and a family came in with a baby, a little teeny baby in one of those little carriers, and sat it down on the table next to them, and the baby woke up. And they all went, oh, did you have a good nap? Oh, you're looking hungry. And I tell you right now, that baby was not ready. That baby did not understand a word they were saying. These people were crazy. According to everything we do to our children in speech therapy, that baby had none of the pre-readiness skills, none of the prerequisite skills to even be spoken to. If you look at what we do to our children in speech therapy, we would say, until you can discriminate between two photos, we're not even going to speak to you. That's not how language develops. We all know babies learn how to talk because we talk to them. We provide them a model of language. We have all brought a baby home from the hospital and talked to it. And not a single one of us went, this is crazy because this creature can't begin to understand what I'm saying, but we did it anyway. Because we know that our babies need a year of being spoken to before they can start to comprehend language, 
hear the different patterns in what we're saying, start to make meaning of the different words, and come up with their very first word that they can say. And our typically developing babies hear about 4,000 words a day. And after having 4,000 words a day modeled for them in ordinary, regular life, overhearing the conversations of others, listening to us as we talk to them and as we talk to everyone else, after 4,000 words a day for 365 days, they can usually say one word. So that's typical language development. That's the level of immersion in language that typical kids need. When we look at our children with Angelman, we have to ask, have they ever had a model of language they could access? Because they hear all this spoken language, but they can't access it. So they've never had immersion in language that they could access. And that's really what this whole next year is going to all be about. We learn how to communicate by learning how to listen, learning how to make sense of what's being said around us, while we also learn how to explore, how to repeat those sounds, how to babble with those sounds, how to express the sounds that we're hearing, the language that we're hearing. So many of our kids have been completely cut off from expressive communication because they can't use their mouths to speak. So they're hearing all this language, but they don't actually have a model that they can use. When it comes down to it, writing is taking an idea from your head putting it into some kind of symbol form that you can share with someone else. So if you're a six-year-old, you understand all these words. You can write, maybe read this many words. You know how to spell many, this many words. So when a six-year-old goes to write, they have to take all the ideas they're thinking and reduce it down to the few words they actually know how to represent. That's what using a communication system is all about. There is fascinating research that when our kids are trying to use a communication system, they are using the exact same part of their brain that you use for writing. They're not using the same part of the brain for speaking because we can usually speak so many more words than we actually know how to write, right, as we're developing language. So we have to figure out how to support our kids to take all the ideas in their head and reduce them to a relatively small number that they can access on a system. And that's exactly the same cognitive process that kids go through when they learn how to write. And we can do that if we understand that's what it is. And reading is being able to comprehend what other people have reduced into some kind of symbol form. Right? So just start thinking of our kids. You'll see that we'll talk a lot about communication and literacy, and it's because they're so closely entwined. When we look at how language develops with small children, it really comes down to learning how to understand and share in the experiences of other people through hearing their stories and being able to share your own stories back. Being able to, in some way, so you think of a small child who's imagining something. My, one of my girls, um, my younger daughter would draw these hilarious pictures when she was little. So she'd bring me these scribbles and I'd say, oh, this is great, what is this? And she'd say, it's a, sh a puppy and it's hiding behind a shark. Oh, because I would just be seeing scribbles, I'd have no idea, really, where's the shark? Right there. Where's the puppy? It's hiding, you can't see it. That is typical language development. That's having an idea that you're trying to share. She couldn't reduce it to writing. All she could reduce to writing was those few scribbles, but she could tell me about it. Our kids have been cut off from that. Their disability, the nature of their disability is that they can have all these thoughts but not be able to tell us what they're thinking. And we have to figure out how to develop their writing and reading tools, really, to help them communicate because it's really going to be the process of writing, of figuring out how to take your thoughts and translate them to a system that's going to help them communicate. And that's why we have to learn how to use their tool first because you will find it is hard. It's really hard to take all these ideas in your head, this sentence I just said, I'm saying really long sentences and reduce them to what I can say on any communication system. So we have to do this journey first. Um, Linda Burkhardt and Gail Porter are just masters in the areas of helping complex kids like ours um, be able to access language. These are their slides talking about how with our typically developing kids, spoken language goes in and a year later, spoken language starts to come out, right? For our kids, if they can't develop speech, then spoken language goes in, but there, 
there isn't a tool for it to come back out. They need aided language to go in. So aided language just means we're aiding our language. We're augmenting our language with an alternative, with a visual, with something else. Um, there's a few different ways that we can do aided language. So we can sign. And a lot of our kids have amazing signs. But it's not an actual language unless other people can also communicate with you using that same language. And for most of our kids, they have adapted signs that only make sense to themselves and to the people who know them best. But we have to figure out aided language, which just means using another language system. People will say that our kids can't learn symbols. But if your children currently understand spoken language, then they understand auditory symbols. Because words are an auditory symbol. When you hear me speaking and you hear that word, you've learned to associate that sound with a specific idea and to make sense of it. So if your kids currently understand speech, they understand auditory symbols, they just can't generate it back. So we have to give them a way that they can generate it back because they can take it in, but they can't send it back out again. So if they currently understand auditory symbols, we're going to provide them with visuals that they will match the sounds of language with a visual so that they can express it back. That's really all we're trying to work on here. If you have a kid like mine who didn't appear to understand spoken language, what we've done with Maggie, I believe, is teach her to understand spoken language by teaching her a visual language first. Because like most of our kids, she is highly visual, and she's actually been able to make more sense of language through having a visual support for what we're saying than just relying on her ears. And I don't think that's typical for our kids, but that's where my, my Maggie's been. So we're going to talk about what this aided language looks like. And you'll have, don't, you don't have to take it all in right now. There's going to be a lot more information coming through these webinars, through the downloads. But we are trying to figure out aided language systems for our children. That's really what this is all about, an AAC system. An AAC system, there has to be a system. There has to be a piece of hardware. So when people say, I got my son an iPad for communication, then we say, great, you have the hardware. Right? If they have a Dynavox, if they have a pod book, that book is the hardware. So the hardware can be paper, the hardware can be the device. They have to have symbols. Symbols are just like the sound of a word is a symbol, a, a visual symbol is an image that represents that word. It can't just be pictures because there are too many ideas you cannot take a picture of. I can't take a picture of a nightmare so that Maggie can tell me she had a nightmare. It's actually really hard to take a picture of bored, believe it or not, that I'm feeling bored versus frustrated versus irritated, right? If you take pictures of these different emotions and show them to people, we all come up with different ideas of what that means. We need to come up with a symbol because the symbol represents the one word and is precise in a way that photos um, are very concrete and are not. And then those symbols have to be organized into something called a vocabulary. So for example, the pod system is a gorgeously organized vocabulary. There's a whole system. You can navigate from one word to the next to construct messages, one phrase to the next. Uh, the core word systems that you'll hear more about today are a vocabulary. So we've organized a system to get from one word to the next to construct a message. This is an example of a core word display um, made by a speech therapist named Maureen Nevers for beginner communicators using a system proloquo. So the hardware is the iPad and the app proloquo to go. The symbols are called symbol sticks. And those are what those graphic images are in each box. And the vocabulary is how it's been organized into what's called a core system with the most frequent words that we use on the home page, and then fringe or categories, which are those folders. So I can say, I like, if I want to say, I like pizza, I like, and I'm going to need to go to a folder like food. I like trains. I would go, I like. Well, it doesn't look like I have a things folder on this one. This is a brand, oh, there's a things folder. Th I like, and then I would go to things to finish my sentence. So this is a core, core vocabulary system. This is a core symbol display. We actually have laminated copies of these displays over here on the table. There's a few different options just for you to look at, just for you to compare and see what's out there and see what you like. So this is not a full vocabulary because this is just a core display. It's using board maker symbols. So if you have a child who's been using PEX, if they uh, have been introduced to POD, then they're familiar with board maker symbols. So that's the symbol system. 
These happen to be the black and white version, but you can see the difference just in terms of what they look like. So it's a different symbol system. If our kids have been learning one symbol system, they've been learning a visual language in that symbol system. One of the most common things we see is that they've got some pec symbols at schools, and they've got some proloquo, and they're doing some writing with symbols. When we checked, they were using four different symbol sets with Maggie. Well, I'm trying to teach her a visual language. Speaking four languages to her at once, where she never knows which language will be in front of her, doesn't make a lot of sense. So we need to, as we're thinking about a communication system, there has to be a consistent symbol set, and it has to be organized into something called the vocabulary. So we have to come up with an alternative system for our kids, because if they are relying only on their bodies, they will never be able to express abstract thoughts. It'll be very hard for them to tell us if, something, if someone's hurting them. It'll be very hard for them to ask questions about what's going to happen tomorrow. It'll be very hard for them to tell any kind of story about something that happened yesterday. So for them to be able to communicate all the reasons that we communicate, we have to come up with an alternative system. It's so common for us as parents to go, no, really, telepathy exists because I have it with my child. I can look at her and tell what she's thinking, right? We have become so in tune to our kids, but the rest of the world hasn't. And our kids are still thinking things we don't know that they're thinking. And the only way we are going to find out those things is if we can figure this out. This is a long-term investment in their learning. This project is going to last a year. Teaching our kids, helping our kids access language is going to take a lot longer than a year. But the, the strategies you'll learn, everything we're going to learn through this process is to develop language. Remember that typical kids, they get to hear a model of over 4,000 words spoken a day for a whole year before they're expected to say one word. Even when we're doing our very best, even when I'm as good a parent in real life as I am on Facebook, I'm still not modeling 4,000 words a day, right? So it's going to be longer for Maggie because of what I'm not doing, what I'm trying to do as much as anything, because I have not been able to provide the same immersive environment for Maggie that I was able to provide for her younger sister, because her younger sister can access speech and Maggie can't. When it comes down to it, spoken language is simply un inaccessible to kids who can't speak. Lots of research about this, that the more we talk to our kids, it can only build so much of a foundation of language because they can't express it back. And language develops through interaction. It doesn't develop through just watching. We have to figure out language so that our kids can actually interact around language. Um, yeah, and we know that kids who cannot speak get a fraction as much exposure to a language that they can access, a visual language, modeling of symbols, um, as typically developing kids. There are lots of different kinds of visual languages. There's different symbol sets. When you use the alphabet, you're really, when you're typing, you're using a visual language to communicate. That's really what it comes down to. Um, when we're using visual symbols, we're using a visual language to communicate. We can do it with text or with symbols that represent a whole word. So letters represent part of a word, symbols represent a whole word, and can even represent a whole phrase. If your kids know this symbol, then they know a symbol and they can learn symbols. Right? If only our symbol systems had an entire marketing team behind them, so that all of the symbols that our kids are exposed to could have the level of exposure that this one gets. But why do, why is this the first symbol that most typically developing 12 months old, 12 month olds know? Anybody have a guess? They see it everywhere. Why else? Because they like the French fries, right? It is personally meaningful. It results in something they really care about and they see it everywhere. If we can immerse our kids in, the, in their symbols, the same way that McDonald's knows how to immerse our kids in their symbols. If your kids know that symbol, that's the YouTube symbol. If your child from their iPad can touch an icon because they know there's videos behind it, then they can learn symbols. They've already learned one. That is a symbol. And overwhelmingly, that's one of the first symbols our kids learn. Here's another symbol that a lot of our kids learn quickly. Certainly my kids did, but it's because of the heavy immersion that they had in this symbol versus the others. 
right? If your kids can learn logos like this, they can learn symbols. But we have to figure out how to make their symbols as interactive, as immersive, to surround them as richly, to have things happen because they used them. The way that using your Starbucks logo gets you a, mo a mocha, the same kind of things have to happen with their other symbol set sets. So we will model communication systems for our kids so they can learn that if you combine this symbol with that, then something happens and you generate a message. We will model to teach our kids that there's two ways to say anything. You can say it with words from your mouth or you can say it with symbols on a display. But we have to teach our kids to be bilingual, right? Their typical brothers and sisters only have to speak one language. They only have to be able to speak the same language they hear. Our kids have to be able to comprehend that spoken language and actually speak a different one back. They have to be able to speak a visual language back. We will, all we do is highlight symbols on a communication display while we talk to our children. And it is no different, the input is no different than when you speak to a baby, to a small child, they are starting to make meaning of that through immersion. That's what we're gonna do for our kids. We will start at the very beginning because our kids haven't had that same immersion that our babies did. So I'm not comparing our children to babies, but where their language development might be, might be relatively young because they've never been immersed in a language. So we're going to immerse them in a language and we'll start at the beginning if we need to. If they've never learned symbols, then we have to start at the beginning. Um, just because we have to give them that same language experience the typical kids got in order to learn how to speak. We know this works. There has not been a study doing aided language input only with children with Angelman syndrome. But there have been so many studies of what happens when the communication partners, that's us, that's teachers, that's siblings, siblings can be some of the most important, when all of us start using symbols. There is so much research that if you take individuals who are adults versus young children versus school age, who have no speech or very little speech, who are not currently using any form of alternative language system, who are mobile or not. There's studies on all of this. And if you start using symbols with them, we will see over the course of a year, over the course of two years and three years, over the course of 15 years, there's longitudinal studies, that they will develop stronger expressive communication and receptive communication. They will significantly increase their use of symbols they will, most children who just receive a year of the input that you're going to hear about this year, start to generate multi-word messages. Um, they increase their participation in classroom activities, in the community, they start initiating communication with new partners. It is equally effective regardless of the age of the person that we're modeling the symbols for. And within the Angelman community, our anecdotal evidence is it's more effective with adults. It's faster in its effectiveness with adults because they've already learned so much language that now we can just match it up with symbols and help them move further. But the long-term gains are significantly stronger than for kids who have not had language modeled for them. Because those other kids are basically, I mean, think about it. We're talking to our kids in one language. If we're providing them a visual system, like maybe we've gotten them an iPad with an app and we put it in front of them and we say, touch your symbols, find your words, it is about as helpful as us handing them a dictionary and saying, use your words. It's about as helpful as us handing them a Spanish dictionary and saying, use your words. I'm going to talk English to you and you're going to learn Spanish using that dictionary because it's just a collection of words until it's actually used. And we're the first ones who have to figure out how to use them. Every single one of our sons and daughters is ready for this. If they already have strong expressive skills, like we had some kids just this last weekend in Sacramento with amazing use of their communication systems, then we will use their systems to model more sophisticated communication. So we had kids who could put together four and five symbols to tell exactly what kind of sandwich they wanted to order. That's great. But they couldn't yet have a conversation. They didn't yet have a system that let people tell them about all of their favorite activities, what they like to do on the weekends, and actually have an interaction back and forth with another person. So that's what we would model for those folks. We have so many kids with very strong receptive language, so they understand all these spoken words, these auditory symbols, and we're going to model language for them so they can match that auditory sound with a visual and be able to reproduce it. 
And we have a minority of our kids who are still trying to understand spoken language, who are still, whose brains are not working well enough with their ears to be able to quickly take in speech. Because speech is here and then it's gone. If you stopped paying attention a few minutes ago and now you just suddenly woke up again, you missed it, it's gone. I said it, it's gone. The minute I say a word, it is gone. And some of our kids need the support of visual symbols because it stays there. When we talk to them with symbols, it's static. It can be there and it gives them more processing time to actually understand what we just said. So we can enhance their comprehension for those kids who need it by using a symbol system. And I would say of all three of these groups, the kids who don't appear to be understanding very much spoken language are the kids who most need this intervention. What we'll talk a lot about over the course of the next year is what we call core words. And all that means are those are those high frequency words we use all the time. I, t I checked once in my family. I just made a little mark for every time I used the word go in the first two hours of the day trying to get the kids ready for school. We use go a lot. You need to go brush your teeth. We need to go get dressed. You need to go sit on the toilet. You need to go down and get breakfast. You need to go pack your backpack. We need to go grab your backpack. We need to go. We gotta get to school. We gotta go. We used go like 25 times in an hour. This is why we focus on what's called core words. These are high frequency words. You use the word go as often at home as you do at school, as often in the community. These are high frequency words. When we have instead been focusing on low frequency words, our kids only get a few opportunities to use them. So I'll go with kids and I'll observe a speech therapy session and they've got bubbles and they've got balloons. There's only so many times in the day that you get to talk about balloons and bubbles, right? It tends to be every Tuesday and Thursday at 1.15 to 1.45 with Miss Eliza, your speech therapist. Well, that's great that you can talk about balloons and bubbles there, but what are the words you can actually talk to everybody with all across the day? These are the words we have to model. We already know that our kids can learn the symbols and the photos for their objects that they care about. We already know that. Our kids are using photos and things all the time. If they are excited enough by the nouns in their lives, then they figure out how to tell us that they want their iPad, that they, you know, all those kind of object-based things, their favorite toys, that kind of stuff. They communicate that already. Those are very easy for them to grasp. What they need our, us to immerse them in is those more abstract words that are much harder actually to take a picture of. So these are called core words. This is one of Kay Ahern's displays. It was on Practical AAC. Is it okay that it's in the, I thought so. Is it okay if we post this to share? Okay, so this will go into the Facebook group. Um, Kate, when are you presenting? Next, so stay, listen to Kate. Um, she is far more experienced in this than I am and she's awesome and she's working with a number of our Angelman families in the Boston area and really proving that we've been working on the bottom of what our kids can express rather than really focusing on what's the, what's the capacity that we can build them up towards. We've got kids where if they have for access reasons, maybe they've only got nine symbols. Well, these are nine symbols I might consider giving them. Words like stop. Stop now. Right? We've got, if, we're, if they're only going to have nine words, then it better be nine words that let them make a change and have some power over their lives, because that might be what matters most. It's a little humbling that Maggie's first word was stop. And her most common sentences are stop it, stop that, and stop now. She actually, I think I've learned so much from her, from how she uses her symbols. I think she wants the world to slow down a little bit. She wants all of us to slow down a little bit. She wants all of us to give her a little more physical space, to not rush her so much, and to not tr constantly try to control what she does. And the words that helped give her, that had the most meaning in the beginning, were stop. This is um, just a, a, a screenshot of the app Proloquo2Go. When I surveyed our families, I surveyed about 700 Angelman families, about 250 had Proloquo2Go, so it's the most common. For most of our kids, it's been set up as a requesting system. It's been set up more like pecs. They can ask for things, they actually can't talk about things. So this is what, the, um, this is what that looks like. And we've been joking that there's some, um, I think I have a slide on this, what we call Angelman core which is there's core words, and then there's some words that are particularly core for our kids. And symbols like hurry up, come here, now, silly. For some of our kids, go away, come here, go away, come here. 
I've been doing an experiment with some of our kids who have been told, whose parents have been told their child can't learn symbols. Well, first of all, we know you can learn symbols to begin with as cause and effect. Gail Van Tatenhoff has proven this. So if you don't understand that that symbol means a word, that's okay. We can still work with that because you can learn it as cause and effect. And we have demonstrated this over and over again with Angelman kids where we give them the symbol for jump. And every time they hit it, we jump. Seriously. Jump. And our kids are like... <laughs> And we model again, jump, and I'll jump. Really? Jump, 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 jump. Okay, so then we introduce sit. Jump and sit, or jump and jumping jacks. And our kids are sitting there going, you are hilarious. This is awesomeness. I, look at how ridiculous I can make my grown-ups act. Right? That is the start. We can totally work with that. So you can start learning symbols through cause and effect. As long as it's just in a consistent location that you can access, you can start learning it as cause and effect. This is another example. So these are just various systems that take those high frequency words, and in this case it's in proloquo, so that's the, that's the vocabulary, that's the hardware, and there's folders for all those other words, um, like the places I want to go, the people I care about. When we're modeling these kind of systems in the beginning, like let's say you've got, raise your hand if you've got proloquo and don't know what to do with it. Okay, yeah, that's the most common that's kind of the most, con the largest family group where people, I bought Proloquo, so I know I'm on the right track. I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. So what we do is we take screenshots and we just start modeling the paper system. And there's some screenshots of Proloquo over here that you can take, literally. So our kids are excited because Gretchen is coming over later today. I'll touch, I like people. Gretchen. That's it. Maybe I start with just like. Oh, you're laughing because you know Gretchen's coming. I like her too, and I'll just touch like. That's it. That's as easy as, as it is. It is so much easier for us as adults to model a paper version of our kid's system than it is to remember to always have the iPad there, swipe the screen, hit the proloquo icon, wait for it to load, and quickly say like, because by then our kids have left the room. So what we've been having parents do all across the country is take screenshots, blow them up big if you need to, whatever you need to do, but make sure you've always got your words in arm's length. If you're using pod, then you've been trained through pod to always have that pod book on you. And we're trying to learn from those pod families who are having such success by making sure that our kids who are proloquo users, we always have our words handy to model for them as well. And I dare you to try to model words on a kid's system by taking their device away from them. So if you've only got one iPad, then you especially need to be able to take a screenshot, blow it up or not, whatever size works for you, and start modeling on a paper version, because our kids don't tend to give up their devices very quickly. Um, here's a, a system that's actually, so this is just a core word page. But take a look at all these words, right? So if we're starting out with our kids, we can start out by everything they smile and laugh at, we indicate the like symbol. You like that. That's it. That's all we're doing. If, um, where's the word don't on this display? Is there a don't? Yeah, there's the word don't. So you see that blue symbol here closer to me that says don't? If they're frowning and pushing something away, then we say, oh, you don't like that. That's all we're doing is pairing what we see them communicate with the words that help them communicate it more, more specifically. There are, I was experimenting with one of these trying to think about how many sentences I could put together with just, I think it was 40 words. I think this one might be 45. And I was able to put together over 300 sentences just with these words. Like, so just starting with I. Or just, let's start with you because we're talking to our kids. Oh, you want that. You have one of those. Oh, you feel. You feel frustrated. You feel happy. You feel excited. Oh, you need that? Okay. Right? So just using those four words on the top, I can already start reflecting back to my child using language she can access the different things that she's communicating to me. And we'll spend a lot more time over, this, over the next year. This is just an introduction. There is an alternate assessment consortium out of the University of North Carolina, like the world's smartest woman, Karen Erickson, is leading it. Um, it's alternate assessment, meaning they're looking at new ways to assess the most complicated kids. How do we teach 
and measure what we're teaching the most complicated kids. They, um, obvi they had one of the first places they had to start with was how do we get words into those kids' hands because these are the kids who didn't have communication systems. These are our kids. Um, and so they analyzed what were the 40 most important words if a child only had access, a student, anyone, only had access to 40 words. What were the words that were the highest frequency that they could use in the most places that were the first words that kids learn how to speak, the first words kids learn how to read and write, and the words that allow you to participate. Because if you have things like a word like different, that actually allows you to communicate so much more. So I was having a bad mother moment the other night. I took Maggie to get new shoes because in a four week trip, her, her feet have grown by two shoe sizes. Um, I take her to the store to get new shoes. I forgot her communication system back in the hotel room. We've been totally slacking on this road trip. I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I've not been doing it. That actually happens far more often than, uh, than I wish it did. So I'm completely on this journey with you. But Maggie has also learned through all of our practice that every time she's offered a choice, she'll always be offered something different. So do you want one of these two pairs of shoes or do you want a different pair? And she was just like, mm, definitely different. Okay, do you want one of these two pairs of shoes or do you want something different? Different. Then the Doc Martens came out. Oh, Corey was there. <laughs> we had to reassure her, okay, fine, you'll get the Doc Martens, but you still need to pick out a pair of summer shoes. But she had learned the process of the language that she could actually, even without her system, she could pretty specifically communicate which shoes she wanted. So when you have those mom fail moments, if we've laid some more of the foundation before, then that can also make a big difference. That's probably not the best story to tell you guys right now, but just know you're gonna have so many, so many parent fails, and it's okay, because we're all on this with you. Last, this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about, is just sort of which language is best, because this is one of the most common questions we hear. Which app is best? Which system is best? Tell me which system to buy, right? We hear this so often. So many of our families do not have a speech therapist who will support them to find the best system for their kids. And so our families are out there like vigilantes trying to sort out this incredibly complex field of alternative communication um, without like a professional to help us navigate it. So which system is best? Anybody have ideas? Shout it out. Oh, Kate, no, it doesn't get to be Kate. Who else, go ahead. The one that people use, exactly. The English language is often considered to be a good language, but we should really reconsider it because it has so many failings. Do you know it's one of the most inconsistently spelled languages out there? It's terrible. It has a completely complex structure. Learning how to read and write in English is really complicated. There's simpler languages out there. Would we consider changing our language for another one because it's better? No. We learn English even though it's so hard because everyone around us right now is learning English. If you are bilingual or trilingual, we had a dad in Sacramento who spoke six languages. You can bet other people spoke those languages around him. That's what makes the system best, is what people are using. If you find a system that works for you and you use it with your child, that makes it the best system you can find. And we've consistently found in these workshops we've been doing this summer, find out what the family already has and let's bump it up a notch. There's so many things we can do to improve whatever you have. But so many of us spend years waiting to find the right system rather than getting started on one right now. And getting started modeling language is more important, in my opinion, than f waiting for that perfect system to come along. Because I tell you, none of them are perfect. None of them are. There's only degrees of which ones allow us to be more effective. But if it allows you to say all the things that you need to say to your child, if it allows your child to say all the things that your child needs to say back to you, if it also allows you to say all the things you need to say to your husband and your other children, then it's a good system. So if you don't have that kind of system, we need to help you find them. There's a bunch of different options, and over the course of the next year, you'll be able to see more of those different features. But getting started with anything is better than waiting for something. So the system that the most people use and understand, the more people, just like if we wanted to teach our children Spanish, our other kids, anybody Spanish, we would want to immerse them in Spanish to learn it, we have to do the same thing with our kids, knowing that in the beginning, 
if all they're doing is passively listening, if they're not even watching, that's okay, because not a single one of us took a baby home from the hospital and said, pay attention, watch my mouth, I'm talking to you. None of us did that. We all knew that would not be appropriate, to take a newborn baby, a three-month-old baby, a six-month-old baby, and insist they watch us while we spoke to them. Instead, we trusted that by using language around them, they would be able to take it in, make sense of it, start reproducing it, start using it themselves when it was the right time. We have to take that same approach with our kids, knowing that we're not going to be able to give them the same level of input, the same level of modeling that their typical siblings got, that typical kids got, that we got growing up. We got more immersion in a language than, our, than we can provide our kids with Angelin. So it's going to take them longer, most likely, to be able to start using the system, and that's OK. I'm just going to say one quick thing about motor planning, because remember those words from heaven those words from heaven that float down and show up on a Velcro display and then float back up again. We really have to think about that because our kids have physical and fine motor disabilities. We need to make it easy for them to find their language. We need to not keep moving it around. It is so common to see kids with systems where to find the word they want, they have to look at every single icon there. So motor planning. You know about motor planning if you know how to type. So who knows how to type? OK. Who learned by having two letters put in front of you? Type A, now type B. Type A, now type B. A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B. OK, you got two letters down. Here, now you're going to have four. We're growing you to four. You're ready for four. Ready? A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. Awesome. You learned how to type four letters. We're going to give you six now. Now we're going to give you something more. Now we're going to give you the whole alphabet. And now that you're ready for the whole alphabet, we're going to change the order of all those around and we're going to give you a QWERTY. All of us know that this would be absurd to learn typing this way. But how many of our kids have been taught to use a communication system where things moved around that often so that they could never simply learn where their fingers needed to go? Given their neurological disorder, they need a consistent display. So we'll talk about, um, over the course of the next year, making sure our kids can access a lot of words with one predictable motion, two predictable motions, where they know where to find the language. They know how to navigate it. It needs to be consistent. Um, we're going to start by just modeling one word, if that's where our kids are at. If they haven't yet learned that symbols represent words, then we might use just one word at a time to represent our message. You will bore your children brainless if you try to model every single word of a sentence. It's, it's terribly boring to even have to witness. So just know that. You will frustrate yourself. You will feel like a failure if you try to model every word the way you're thinking it. So we're going to start out with keywords. And then once our kids start using one word, then we start build on that so that we're always providing them a level above what they can currently do. And no matter how overwhelming it feels, know that it is feasible. There's been research. Can parents learn how to do this? Yes, we can. Can teachers learn how to do this? Yes. Can paraprofessionals learn how to do this? Yes. Can parents who are English as a second language learn how to do this? Yes. It's awkward. It's not natural, right? Because what's natural to us is to use speech. It's incredibly awkward to try to take all the ideas from your head and reduce them to a few symbols on a display and figure out how to maximize what you can say with relatively few symbols. But that's exactly what we're asking of our kids. And even if our kids are already showing really strong skills in using some kind of system, we need to model even more. We need to model because we are in solidarity with them. We respect how hard it is for them to get those hands to do what they need them to do. And we're willing to put ourselves through whatever we're asking our kids to do. That's the number one reason why we do that for them. Are your brains ready to ooze out of your ears, or can I just show you the, how it all relates to literacy? Are we good? You want the connection to literacy? OK, here we go. So last, I swear this really is the last. Um, I get a lot of questions about people have gone to workshops. OK, you told me I need to model language. I got a pod book. I'm good. I'm trying to model language. And you also said I need to do predictable chart writing, and I'm supposed to be writing books with my kids and remnant books. When should I work on literacy versus communication? 
My response to that is literacy is communication. Communication is all the ways that we share our messages with other people. Literacy is all the ways we put it into some kind of symbol form to share it with other people. Our kids have to become literate because they have to learn how to use symbols to be able to share the ideas that we don't already know they're having. So what we're asking for as our, of our kids is to really start the literacy journey, which is fine. It sounds so overwhelming. The first time I said to Maggie's school team, when are we going to start working on her literacy? When are we going to start teaching her how to read and write? The special educator said, oh, we don't do that with kids like Maggie, right? They didn't know where to start. I was like, OK, we've sorted that out. I went back to school. I was like, I'll go to graduate school and I'll find out how you can do it. I really thought it was that easy. Um, but literacy begins to develop from the moment we bring our babies home from the hospital and start talking to them. Your kids have early literacy skills. Um, th that's really its own um, session, but that's one of the assessment tools that we'll be using, is what do your kids currently do with books? Do they know that books exist? Score one. Do they chew on them, mouth on them, drool on them? Yay, they're interacting with books. Score two. Really, it starts with that. Their brothers and sisters and all of us as young children, that's where we started. And no one said, can you believe that she's mouthing the books? Take them away until she shows she's ready. We were allowed to do that, and then we were provided the support to move further. Are your children starting to touch the page of the book? Are they starting to actually point to things on the page and not just bang on it? Have they learned that books are different from blocks and different from iPads, and we do different things with them? Have they learned that there's two different kinds of things on the page of a book, that there's pictures and illustrations and there's words? Those are, that, that's a really important developmental step. Have they started to realize that the words are what we speak? and the meaning is in the words on the page. That's all the kind of early literacy skills that develop in kids from the time they're born until the time they start kindergarten. When we are working on all the things we're going to talk about over the next year, we're going to talk about how to develop those literacy skills in our kids so that they get to a point where they can start using the symbol set of the alphabet. Because the symbol set of the alphabet will really give them total autonomy. It'll be a while. Not all of our kids might get there. For Maggie, what I told her school team is it's a 50-year plan. She can retire from literacy instruction at age 60. We got 50 years. She's only got, she only had at that point 10 more years left of school. I need to know that what you're doing over the next 10 years is the first 10 years of a 50-year plan. And that's part of what this project will be looking at over the next year. All of these things that we're talking about are all things that are going to start moving our kids along that spectrum of literacy to begin developing those skills. We're going to support our kids to show they have stories to share, because that is what is most likely most personally meaningful to them. They probably have already figured out ways to get the foods that they want, to go to some of the places they want to go to, to ask about the favorite people in their lives. They're probably already developing those skills. We're going to help them realize that they can share their stories as well, that they can understand the stories of other people, and they can share their stories with others. I'm going to skip over those. It's about literacy, communication through literacy by inviting our kids in and interacting with them with language. Because interaction with language is what teaches us language, not just observing it. It's about interaction. Um, and most importantly, I think, especially for our kids, especially for kids who, like Maggie, by the time she was nine years old, I'm sorry, been there, done that. Symbols would be put in front of her, and she was like, oh, again? And part of the problem was that the symbols kept changing their minds. It'd be, you know, a new special educator would come and she'd use a new system, and here's a symbol for that, and a symbol there, a symbol everywhere, a symbol like, I don't know, I think I'm thinking of McDonald's Farm or something. But symbols were all over the place, but they weren't used in any kind of coherent system, and she gave up on them. She had no interest in them. She did not think that those symbols were helping. The symbols were often used just to boss her around, to tell her what was next. Well, no wonder she didn't realize that they could actually be her voice, right? So we'll work on that. But we're going to be inviting our kids in. We're not making them do this. We're not dragging them kicking and screaming. We are showing them that they can enrich their interactions with other people by using these systems. And that means we will model with no expectation that they use it. Because one of the worst mistakes we can make is put a symbol set in front of somebody and say, talk to me with this. 
I guarantee that if you take one of those symbol sets and put it in front of your husband or your wife or your mother and say, talk to me with this, that they'll go, huh? And that's exactly how our kids tend to respond. We're going to model how it's meaningful rather than insist on it. And you'll learn over the course of the next year about doing things, for example, with environmental print, like with logos, because that's some of the first symbols that kids learn, about telling personal experience stories, um, about, so for example, how we can support our kids to share the stories of things they've done, their own personal experiences. Um, helping them write all about me books and writing books for them until they can help write them themselves so they can really share who they are as an, as an individual. We'll work on things like rhyming and phonics and phonemic awareness so that they can really start to sort out the sounds of language and see how it changes. We'll do things over this next year um, such as writing remnant books. Remnant books are just where you take a tangible object related to an experience and you put it into a book so that those kids who are the most concrete and tangible have something real hands-on. And you can see that, that remnant book page is the pink page with the tooth. Riley selected the glove the dentist used to put in the finger in the mouth as the, the remnant of that experience. That's what made her most remember the dentist. We'll work on alphabet books, we'll work on sight words and, and early books for our kids. We'll figure out how to help our kids interact while we read books with them. If they're too old for things like brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Then we can rewrite those books. Maggie's brown bear book is Maggie, Maggie, what do you see? I see Harry Styles looking at me. Um, and we will use our kids' communication systems to help them write books in what's called predictable chart writing, which sounds complicated, but it's actually really simple. But we're going to give this out in little bite-sized pieces over the next year, and you can take your own time going through it. So hopefully it won't be too overwhelming. So that's that. Um, Thank you, everyone. I'm sure everyone uh, will join me with the uh, gratitude and appreciation we have for Erin Sheldon and all the wonderful work she's doing for all of us. It's changing our lives. Thank you, Erin. <laughs>